the order that will follow is uh, slightly different from what is an order of service printed. We will now take our time at the Lord's table and uh, then have uh, body, line, pastoral prayer following that. Uh, as we prepare for the Lord's table, it's helpful to remember that uh, social distancing is not something new. Uh, it actually is rather old and goes back in one form to the law that God gave his people Israel about being holy. Because to be holy means to be separated from sin and from things that would uh, pollute and hinder our relationship with God and put a barrier between us and him. And in the ways that God dealt with his people in Israel, that holiness had external forms, forms that we no longer follow, that Jesus Christ has fulfilled by his death on the cross and his resurrection and the cleansing that his blood affects, that cleanses us on the inside and that allows us to lead holy lives because we are in Christ and his righteousness has been imputed to us and we are called to practice holiness and that we work that righteousness out into our lives. But over and over again, God said to his people in the Old Testament, be separate. Uh, and I don't think any Bible translation says be socially distanced. But that was the idea, that there was a barrier between Jewish people, Hebrews, and non-Jewish people. So when the Holy Spirit came, the day of Pentecost, and the gospel started going from Jerusalem and then to Judea and then to Samaria and then to the ends of the earth, there was an attitude adjustment that had to take place in the people of God that is described in Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, Simon Peter has a dream. He sees a great sheep bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. And in it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. Peter says, I'm socially distanced. I'm separate from these non-Jewish people. And God says, no, the Holy Spirit is doing something in applying the blood of Christ, as we just sang, and cleansing people from every tribe and tongue and nation and people and race. And when the disciples were having Jesus wash their feet, and Peter said, Lord, not my feet only, but also my head and my hands, Jesus said, he who is bathed is completely clean. And in John 15, he says, you are clean through the word that I have spoken to you. He who is bathed is completely clean and needs only to have his feet washed. And so, in our Christian lives, there's a once and for all cleansing that takes place by the Holy Spirit, applying the blood of Christ to our hearts when we believe. And there's an ongoing relationship where we confess our sins to the Lord and have our feet washed as it were. Communion is an appropriate time to go to the Lord and say, wash my feet. I want to come close to you. I don't want anything to hinder our fellowship together. So it's appropriate as we examine ourselves to ask the Lord to say, Lord, remind me again of that once and for all cleansing. And by the way, I want to get rid of anything that's hindering my fellowship with you and with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I'm going to ask Azeb if he'll play uh, quietly as we prepare to take the elements together. And uh, if you want to, you can begin to uh, take off this uh, mistakes in engineering degree, to take off the purple wrapper just off the top. Don't eat that part. Uh, but just to prepare your elements. And let's look to the Lord, and I'll close this in prayer after we've prayed silently for a time.
Father, thank you that by one sacrifice you have perfected forever those who are being sanctified. We thank you that we have been now justified by his blood. And as we look to you, Lord, we're reminded that we couldn't wash ourselves, we couldn't cleanse our hearts, but you've done that through the death of Christ on the cross. We look to the cross today and even as we prepare to fellowship with you at this table, we're reminded uh, that uh, you've invited us to come freely, and invited your people to meet you here, but Father, cleanse us from anything that would interrupt our fellowship with you, and Father, bring to our minds anything we need to make right with one another. And thank you for loving us with an everlasting love. We pray these things in Jesus' name. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus I took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Amen. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And 1 Peter says, Knowing that you were cleansed, not with corruptible things, but with the blood of Christ. And this blood reminds us, or this cup reminds us of that blood that was shed once for us. Please join me as I give thanks for the cup. Father, we thank you, Lord, for, uh, for this reminder and are grateful. Uh, that Christ suffered once uh, for our sins. Father, I pray that uh, we would consider the cost. We're reminded that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Thank you for the cup. Thank you for the blood that was shed. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's drink together. <clears throat> Father, thank you that much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Father, thank you for each person who's here, and I thank you, Lord, for this remembrance. Help us to walk out into this week with this fresh reminder of sins forgiven, and that it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to your mercy, you've saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take a moment to lift up some requests to the Lord, and I just want to mention that uh, John Fields is preaching to us this morning from Psalm chapter 60. Appreciate uh, John uh, taking us to the Word, and uh, his son-in-law, Chad Sylvester, he's asked to read a scripture for us, and so just want to go ahead and introduce them and mention uh, that they'll be uh, ministering to us. Also, um, many of you have seen these prayer requests as they've gone out over the internet, and, and again, if you are not on our prayer chain and would like to be, please send uh, Betty a message at the church office and we can add you to that email list as well. Some of you don't get enough email, I've heard, and need more. Uh, we want to look to the Lord and ask uh, for grace for Lizzie Janke, whose uh, mom went to be with the Lord just a few days ago. And um, we know that uh, grief takes many different shapes and looks different in different lives. 
Uh, but whatever that shape, we know that Lizzie and her family need encouragement and Josh. And uh, so please encourage them, pray for them, reach out to them as the Lord leads. Uh, some of you know that uh, Margie uh, Snyder got the diagnosis this week uh, from the biopsy, about diagnosis of lymphoma. I don't know what kind. Well, let's pray for the Snyders. Let's pray for uh, Pat Linebaugh as she recovers from double knee replacement. And uh, that's a lot of pain to deal with, and she's recovering, and uh, yet it's, it's tough. So pray for Pat. Uh, last time I knew she had not come home from the hospital yet. Let's pray for our, our sister churches uh, around the country, and um, some of you know uh, that uh, different churches have been affected in Bradley County uh, by what's going on with the pandemic. A friend of mine, uh, Kevin Mangum, who pastors River of Life Church in Demarest, Georgia, was on a mission trip in Alaska and got diagnosed with uh, COVID. And so that obviously has affected that mission trip uh, for Kevin and his church. But let's continue praying for our country in this regard. Uh, pray for Sharon Noctway's son-in-law, Jake, and uh, that's Melanie's husband, and her grandsons, Kyle and Colton, who have COVID-19 as well, are dealing with coronavirus today. And let's pray for George Griffiths, uh, who had a stent put in. He was having some severe chest pain. Uh, he's recovering well. Talked to him a couple days ago. Let's pray for George and Karen. Another request that you have on your hearts, let's look to the Lord together as we pray. Please pray with me. Father, thank you so much for uh, the throne of grace and the way open to us. Uh, Lord, we uh, are the body of Christ and members in particular. And uh, Lord, so many of us are gifted with the equivalent of connective tissue and our ligaments and joints and, and so vital and we've been missing these ministries of people who may not have the offices, but who nevertheless have the ministries of uh, shepherding and serving and helping and teaching and caring. And so, Father, thank you for so many among us who have been doing that day in and day out. Um, Lord, you know the needs that are heavy on hearts today, and we pray for Mark Falzone today. Father, carry him through these days, and Dawn and Tony and Dana, and Lord, and each member of that family. Please speak your peace to their hearts, and Lord, have mercy on them. For Christ's sake, we ask you to raise Mark up. Father, we pray for Lizzie and Josh, and the Lord, as Lizzie is expecting a child here at the end of September, please keep her and this baby safe and give her your peace and provide for all that she and her family need. Help us to know how to love them and others who have suffered loss during these days. Lord, you know the unspoken requests and the things that are breaking our hearts today, are things that we can't fix financially or relationally. And so, Father, we lift those up to you today and thank you that you heal the brokenhearted and you, uh, Lord, have opened the prison and, Lord, you've given us freedom in Christ. But today, Lord, so many of us need to be free from the bondage of anxiety and worry and fear and depression Father, uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, the arrival of Daphne Hall, and I pray that from a young age, she and the other little ones among us would know the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make them wise to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Lord, help us to know how to teach our children your word, even during these days of being scattered, and help us as a church to know how to resume these activities responsibly. Lord, pray for George and Pat and Margie, that you'd heal them and raise them up. Father, we pray for Sharon's son-in-law, Jake, and Colton and Kyle. And now, Father, please minister to us uh, through John and Chad as they minister your word to us. Thank you so much, Lord, for the answers to prayer that we can celebrate here and help us to not forget all your benefits, but to celebrate the good things you've done and to rehearse them to one another, to talk about your wonders and the ways that you've answered. We praise you this day, Lord. Thank you for our nation, its freedom its liberties, and Father, we pray that you'd mend its flaws and that you'd bring healing to our land. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. John, if you'd come and chat, if you'll come and share God's word with us. Uh, I'm taking advantage of this opportunity to introduce one of my sons-in-law to you. Chad married our firstborn, and by the way, was a student of Bruce Morgan in high school in Florida. They've had an interesting reunion or two. 
here in church. Um, Chad's a, a man of God uh, that has a rich heritage in the Word of God, and he leads his family and my, my sweet firstborn well, as well as their four children. He's also a leader at his very large church uh, in uh, middle Georgia, and also uh, is a significant leader as uh, leading an engineering group for his company. So we love to talk about the scriptures when we're together. Theology is always at the tip of our tongues. And, and so I just wanted you to hear his voice and hear the word of God through Chad. Would you stand as Chad reads Psalm 60? Let's read Psalm 60 together. O oh God, you have rejected us, broken our defenses. You have been angry, O oh, restore us. You have made the land to quake. You have torn it open, repair its breaches for it totters. You have made your people see hard things. You have given us wine to drink that made us stagger. You have set up a banner for those who fear you, that they may flee to it from the bow. Selah. That your beloved ones may be delivered, give salvation by your right hand and answer us. God has spoken in his holiness. With exaltation, I will divide up Shechem and portion out the veil of Succoth. Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is my helmet, Judah is my scepter. Moab is my wash basin, upon Edom I cast my shoe. Over Philistia I shout in triumph. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go forth, O God, with our armies. O grant us help against the foe, for vain is the salvation of man. With God, we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. May God honor the reading of his word. Thank you. You may be seated. These are interesting times we live in. Our room displays that, the way we're seated, and that we're being broadcast in three different places at the same time. Maybe you agree with this quote that I saw recently. This week I'm going to sling some candy out the door, toss a turkey in the oven, open a few presents and call it a year. There's some things I'd like to change. But maybe, maybe just maybe, we should talk to God in the forgotten way of biblical lament. Psalm 60 is a lament. His name was Don Dye. I'm sure he's with the Lord now. But he was perhaps my favorite Sunday school teacher in my lifetime. He taught our middle school and high school boys in the church I grew up in. This man could weave the Word of God together and tell the stories and captivate all of those wise guys and snickering teenagers. It was during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we were drawn together in some special ways as a church, much like we are now in this uh, coronavirus. And Don was a, an amazing man of God with a wonderful knowledge of the Word. He followed up our class with visits and phone calls and cards. He loved us to death, and we were a hard bunch to love. Many of them ended up in prison. In fact, uh, my neighborhood had a, a bunch of guys that ended up in prison. I think we had gangs before they were called that. Uh, one of them ended up as uh, an inmate at, at the prison I was a chaplain at in Florida for 12 years. So Don was a very unique and godly man that did wonderful things, and I, I'll never forget him. But interestingly, one day Don didn't show up. Somebody came into the class and announced that Don had sold his house and quit his job and moved to the mountains of North Carolina. You see, Don was afraid. Don stepped out of uh, civilization and went to the hills to hide because of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I should say that for us, that was very real. This was in South Florida, and we had literally 
missile uh, silos built along the highways, and we were 90 miles from Cuba, and people were just selling their homes, boarding up their homes sometimes without selling them, quitting their jobs and running to get out of South Florida. I suspect that some of us would like to run to the hills right now and go into hiding. We have new conversation starters and some new vocabulary. Pandemic, chop zone, riots, personal and national recession, coronavirus, essential services, cancel culture, restricted services, social distancing, all pointing to an uncertain future and time in which we live. Many are wondering if the birth pangs that Jesus spoke about, uh, indicating the beginning of the end time sequence, has already started and is, and is alive with vengeance. Of course, he made sure that we knew that we shouldn't be trying to guess that uh, when he spoke about it. These are difficult days, and so they were for Don Dai and for you and for me. Running to the hills, angry outbursts, vicious Facebook posts aren't Christ-like. Joining a mob isn't the way of Jesus. Ruminating with our friends and loved ones only goes so far and often goes too far. I think we need a word from God. In, in a forgotten part of Scripture, the laments of the Psalms. Now, I know you love the Psalms. Everyone does. And if I were to ask what were your favorite, you would give 23 and 19 and 103 and 63 and 150 and uh, 104. You would just name all kinds. 119, the, the list goes on. And 90, 91, I have favorites too. Uh, but if I mentioned the Psalms of Lament, those sober Psalms, what Michael Card calls uh, uh, sacred sorrows. Are they also part of the word of God to you? Remembering that uh, Paul said clearly to Timothy that all scripture is inspired, is God breathed, and is profitable. And so I'd like to submit and suggest a, a lament today that will help us pray in these kinds of times. I think Psalm 60 is one of those. Eugene Peterson said, uh, it's an interesting thing about laments. Jesus wept, Job wept, David wept, Jeremiah wept. They did it openly. But somehow Christians of all people are embarrassed by tears. And we're uneasy in the presence of sorrow. And we're, we are unpracticed in the language of lament but it's certainly not our biblical heritage. If you would like to grow and mature in joy and in Christ's likeness, through the word of God, your walk with Christ must include laments. He did. I wonder if in our win-win culture, in our uh, bottom line uh, talk, if, if in our language of uh, keep it positive and what's in it for me, we have forgotten this hard part of the Word of God. Somehow it's, it's not, not good for us in private, certainly not in public, to agonize with God and say things like David does here. Oh God, you have rejected us. Or at least it feels that way. What's going on, Lord? We don't like that kind of language. That's not who we are in our American culture. But I suggest our maturity depends on it. Our joy depends on it. Our maturity depends on it and I offer them to you. It's interesting about Psalm 60. Right before it are three Psalms, 57, 58, and 59, which are laments. And you probably notice them if you read through the Psalms once in a while. And I, I always wonder, you don't, I don't wanna be dogmatic about this, but I think the Holy Spirit was involved in the order of the Psalms as well. There's a certain rhythm there. And we're gonna to get to positive and wonderful ones real soon in the Psalms if we're reading through. But in 57 and 58 and 59, it, they are written to the tomb, Lord, do not destroy us. I kind of wonder if that tomb was behind this one too when David wrote it. 
I'd like to suggest two important detours before we jump on the highway called Psalm 60. The first one is the scriptures are truly about God and foremost about him from beginning to end. And you may be a little upset with the outline that you've noticed because I've used the first personal pronoun, I. But I've done so to honor the nature of the Psalms that are really unique in this way. They are both a word from God and they're a word to God. And so they're meant for us to worship and to pray. Many of them individually, some in congregation, uh, but always in prayer and in song. They are songs, they are poetry. Um, they are both communication from God and our communication to Him. I invite you in the days ahead to pray Psalm 60 in your personal devotions. A second thing, second detour. Laments are emotional. The Psalms are for sure, but laments are especially emotional. A part of the emotions that sometimes go untapped. We're a Bible teaching Bible church, and that's wonderful, and that's great. And that's a huge part of the reason I came here and I've stayed here, <laughs> that we're committed to the Word of God. But we aren't as committed to emotional expressions as other parts of the Christian community. And I think the Psalms will help us, certainly in our personal devotions. Somebody said about emotions that they are the language of the soul. They are the cry that gives the heart a voice. And while the Psalms allow us to express our emotions, they seek to shape them into righteous ones. Momentary outbursts don't become dis, dis, disrespectful songs and patterns in the Psalms. Can you do this? Can you cry out to God with this kind of honesty? It's incarnational praying in many ways. I trust that that's a part of your life today. Well, today with David, let us ask the Holy Spirit to see the trouble I feel, the promises I need, and the person I trust. And you can certainly plug in we at each of these points. First, the trouble I feel. I want you to get the heartbeat of David here. I, I wish I was a more emotional person. I, I wish I was more dramatic. I'm, I'm not an actor. I'm not a, a performer. I wish I could do that. Um, I, I should have had somebody else read this uh, in, in the middle of the sermon uh, in real detail. But notice verses 1 through 3 about the trouble David is feeling. And I'm asking that you would be able to pray uh, when you go home and when you have devotions in the week ahead. Lord, this is the trouble I feel. Listen to the language, uh, the emotional language of David in 1 through 3. Oh God, you have rejected us. You have broken our defenses. You have been angry. Oh, restore us. You have made the land to quake. You have torn it open. Repair its breaches for it totters. You have made your people, your very people, to see hard things. You uh, have given us wine to drink that makes us stagger. Strong words, aren't they? Do you catch a little bit of the feel there of David? All those seven times that God, by his spirit, had David record these accusations against God. It's not where he lives, but he doesn't hate to speak to God this way. And he does it throughout the Psalms. Verse 3 is striking. You have made your people see hard things. And that sounds like the days we're in. Have you ever been through an earthquake or a hurricane or a tornado? David says, uh, uh, you've made the land a quake. Uh, you have torn it open. Cheryl and I moved to Portland, Oregon in 1980 so I could go to seminary. We had Joy, who was 18 months old, little Joy. And uh, uh, Mount St. Helens had just uh, exploded. We lived in Portland right across from the Columbia River, and we could see what was left of Mount St. Helens from our second-story rental house and apartment before that. One night, we had just gone to bed. We were in the second story of an apartment building, 
a wood frame structure, and below us was the laundry room. And all of a sudden, I mean literally, it's just like, just pulling the covers up, and all of a sudden, things started shaking. The floor started moving. The cologne bottles on the dresser were rattling. And our first thought was, somebody has something in a washer and it's overloaded on the spin cycle and it's gone crazy. But it, it didn't take long to figure out it wasn't the washing machine. It was Mount St. Helens again with secondary earthquakes. You probably never heard about them back east, but there were quite a few of them. Wow, is that unnerving. We were thinking about a time that Cheryl and I were driving through central Pennsylvania and we, we, all the traffic on the highway stopped and, and we didn't know why. It was raining real hard. We just thought it was just so hard. Everybody couldn't see. And then all of a sudden in front of us, perhaps not even halfway down the aisle, a tree this big around went parallel across the road. We were at the edge of a tornado and didn't know it until afterward. That was pretty scary. The van we were in was just rocking back and forth. I think we stopped and prayed. <laughs> Cheryl and I grew up in South Florida. We can tell you about hurricanes and how the, the winds will rattle beyond the plywood you've nailed in front of them. Somehow it gets through and the house shakes and you don't have water for days and you don't have electricity. And of course, when you're young, it's an adventure. But when, as you get smart and older, maybe, maybe smarter, you realize how dangerous it really is. When it's all done, there's, there's a foot of water on the street. We have literally seen people water ski down the road uh, behind their cars. The water was so deep, uh, boats rather, because the water was so deep. Rattlesnakes floating everywhere. Um, these natural events teach us a great deal about what fear is like but can also tell us something about God and the times in which we live. David says, it's like staggering with too much wine in our system. Um, these circumstances just are shaking us to death like an earthquake. Uh, it's all hard and we don't know where it's going and how it's going to end up. Can you pray to God that way? I trust you will this week. Lord, the trouble I feel and fill in the blank for your personal situation, as well as our national, and even for our church as we adjust and look to the future. Don Dye ran to the hills. Better that we run to God and pour out our hearts in freedom because we're in Christ, and better that we depend on the Holy Spirit who, according to Romans 8, 26, will pray for us in groans we can't understand. He will usher to the throne of God that which our heart is anxious about. Oh God, it seems like you've rejected us. Where are you? Have you forgotten? I'd like to take a moment now and just pray that kind of prayer. Practice it together. Would you pray with me? Yahweh, our Lord, we are too many days wondering where you are and what you're doing. Lord, it feels alone. It feels like we're alone. Like we're on a very small planet in a big universe. And it's such short order, Lord. Things have just kind of undone, become undone. And Lord, I'm scared for those I love. And I wonder what else is next. Are you there? Are you listening? Have you forgotten us? Abba Father, these days feel unsafe, undone, out of control, like, like that earthquake in our apartment, like the tornado in Pennsylvania, like the hurricanes in South Florida. We're staggering like drunks, numb, unable to think at times hiding behind entertainment and useless things, 
trying to just forget what's going on around us. Everything we work for, prayed for, longed for, and planned for seems to be on the line. We long for the new heavens and earth, Lord. That place and time where righteousness dwells and sin is no more. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. David prays, this is the trouble I feel. But then notice that David prays about the promised God in the midst of it all. The promised God. Not just promises, but the promised God. Catch verses 4 through 7. Note, I'll just go through them singularly. Uh, notice verse 4, the first thing about God that he has promised about himself and the way he works. You have set up a banner for those who fear you, that they may flee to it from, from the bow. The uh, Psalms are just replete with references to God as our fortress and our strength and our warrior, our strong warrior. Think about those things here. I love this verse. He set a banner over us. Uh, in the language of and the history of the Old Testament, banners were placed as uh, signs of protection that a great warrior God uh, was over the people of God. Um, I, I almost wish we didn't have the sound buffers. They're needed and that's fine. But I, I always love it when we have banners around the room with verses and descriptions of God, uh, who he is and what he does. Um, uh, we think of the American flag that way as a banner over our troops, over their uh, encampments against enemies. Uh, how sweet it is, how great it is that we have this promise for these times. That God has said, I am your great warrior. Through my son and by my spirit, according to the word of God I've given you, I am your protector, I am your refuge, I am your strength. Notice it says, that uh, God has set up a banner for those who fear him, for those who fear you. What about this idea of fear? That's just an Old Testament idea, isn't it? Well, it does come up in the New Testament, and there's certainly a bunch of it in the book of Revelation, and it's even designated for those who know Christ. Uh, so get it out of your mind that it's just an Old Testament idea. Um, we know fear... Uh, generally as a, a reverence, a deep reverence for God. I, I kind of like what uh, John Piper said not long ago about fear. There is a fear that is slavish and drives us away from God. And there is a fear that is sweet and draws us to him. Moses warned against the one and called for the other. And then he quotes Exodus 20:20. 20, 20. Do you know it? Moses said to the people, do not fear. That was easy to say, wasn't it? All they were going through, Egypt chasing them, enemies everywhere. Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, and that you may not sin. Wow. His banner is over us, as we do not live in fear, but we trust him. Tim Keller puts fear in this way. The fear of God is to be so filled with joyful awe before the magnificence of God that we tremble at the privilege of knowing, serving, and pleasing Him. Wow. It's the loving child who wouldn't want to disappoint their parent, knowing that they could be disciplined, but more importantly, knowing that they're deeply loved and protected and they have no, no sense of wanting to disappoint their parent. Dread is reserved for those without Christ, those without hope, those without a future. But that's not the people of God. Notice the second promise, verse 5. We are his beloved. He says that your beloved ones may be delivered. First part of the verse. Wow, special term of endearment. 
We are his beloved ones. He loves us. We're the objects of his love. It's quickly rising to the surface as uh, one of my top three verses uh, as, as time goes on. Zephaniah 3.17. And it's become popular, which is to me unfortunate. I thought I had it all for myself. But Zephaniah 3.17 says, God rejoices over us. In fact, one translation says that he dances over us. Is that the God you know and worship and serve? Who dances over you? Who rejoices over you? Uh, it's like when the grandkids came. Friday night. Uh, wow, you know, smiles everywhere. Couldn't get enough of them. Hugs around. <sighs> Sorry, not too socially distanced at that moment. Um, wow, you know, there's just, there's just nothing like the grandkids that run to your arms. Uh, there's nothing like that. And it's a very special gift to be called out to be loved by them. Even the ones who are getting older still hug. That's, that's great. Uh, there's a third promise here. There's a third picture of God, a promised picture of God. Um, not only we, are we his beloved, but he acts on holiness, verse 6. Clearly, David says, God has spoken in his holiness. Pastor Jim introduced holiness very well before communion today. That separateness from sin in the life of a follower of Christ. But not only that on our part, but the holiness, which is in mine here, the holiness uh, that is God, who is completely separate from any evil and has nothing to do it. A study of God's attributes, seeing them all working together consistently in mysterious and wonderful ways is a constant worthwhile life study. The implication of, uh, implications of God's purity and separateness are legion for us. How we need to hear about this in these times. God always acts rightly. He's always consistent in his character. He's holy in love and grace and mercy and compassion and good all at once. And only he can do that. And then this thought that I think goes with holiness. Whatever he does is right. I still remember Bill Lyons telling me that one day, many years ago. Whatever God does is right. He's holy. <clears throat> I'm glad we get to talk to him honestly and say it doesn't feel good. Don't like that. But that's not where you camp. It's not where we live. Ouch. A fourth thing about God that's promised in these verses, in verse, verses uh, 6b through verse 8, God is sovereign. doesn't say that term, but there is a sense of God's sovereignty. Sovereignty in this sense, not only that he's in control, but also that he's not given any ground up. Not one inch of earth or history has he surrendered to the evil one and to evil men. Listen in. I, this is just exciting. With exaltation. That's with exuberance, with a shout like your team just won. With exaltation, God is speaking. And it says, with exaltation, God says, I will divide up Shechem. And I will pour out the veil of Sukkoth. Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is my helmet, Judah is my scepter, Moab is my wash basin, and upon Edom I cast my shoe over Philistia, I shout in triumph. God's pretty emotional, isn't he? A lot of emphatic words there, emphatic pronouns, I this, I that. God is sovereign. He hasn't given up one inch of earth or history. It's all moving for his glory in his time and in his way. And we get to ride along. 
These are the promises David needed. I certainly need them, and I think you do too. Don Dye ran to the hills. He forgot the promised God who had a banner over him, who was his warrior and protector. He forgot the promised God who said, I love you so much I gave my son for you. And you are the special object of my love. I dance over you. I exalt over you. I love you that much. He forgot that God was moving in history, even through the Cuban Missile Crisis, and for us the Corona Crisis, and the riots, and the economic instability, and all of these things. He's moving and working in holiness, and he's doing nothing that is wrong. And God says in sovereignty, I'm the one that's in control of history. I'm the one in control of your life. Never forget it. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, we need to come together with the people of God to hear the word of God, to be reminded of your character and works and promises. We can't depend on man or government or riches. Sometimes they're not even doctors. We love and thank you that you placed a banner over us, that you love us in this very special way, that you move in holiness, and that you've not given up one square inch of earth. Teach us to be like Christ while we wait for his coming. One last thing, 9 through 12 in the psalm. You'll notice when it's all said and done, it's about a person that I trust, that we trust. It's not about institutions and governments and pensions and savings accounts and doctors and hospitals and antibiotics and drugs and rich friends and who we know and where we've been and what degrees we have. It's about God. Notice verse 9. Who will bring me to the fortified city? It's a helpful thing in the Psalms to circle words about uh, pronouns about God. Who is it? that will bring us to the fortified city? Who will lead us to one of their great enemies, Edom? He retreats briefly, it would appear, you know, have you rejected us, O oh God? And really the implied answer is no, um, and so forth. And then verse 11, O oh, grant us help against the foe, for vain is the salvation of men. With God we shall do valiantly it is he who will tread down our foes. It would be easy to apply this psalm, and rightly so, to personal situations, not just our national one. Some of you have lost jobs. Some of you have lost work hours and income. We're all wondering about our 401ks, if they'll be there with the way economic things are going. We hear about people losing their health all the time now. Um, What's school going to be like? What work's going to be like? What's church going to be like? What's government going to be like? You know, wow, what's going on, Lord? Have you forgotten? You'll notice verse 11. We pray to our leaders. Uh, we listen to their advice, but there's secondary sources that, um, in fact, it says, for it's in vain that we trust men for our salvation or deliverance. It's not just personal eternal life, but for deliverance and rescue. I like the way that uh, the message paraphrase does 11 and 12 together, uh, understanding that uh, doing valiantly has to do with being confident and, and, and being courageous. Give us help for the hard task, he prays. Human help is worthless. And God will do our very best. He'll flatten the opposition for good. I like that. You may say, I have trouble praying like uh, David or Job or Jeremiah or Jesus. Arthur Pink uh, challenges us. He says, there ought to be no restraint between you and the lover of your soul. Do you love him today? Let's pray one final time before we sing the perfect song, Cornerstone. Let's pray. 
Father, Lord Jesus, Son of God, Holy Spirit, we have heard David's desperate, dependent prayer inspired as scripture for us, for our profit, for our help, for our comfort, for our good. And Lord, we have many foes these days. Woo us to yourself. Transform us into the image of Christ during this time. Help us to move forward in, in a lost world with the message and ways of Jesus, who is our rescuer, our model, our Lord, our God. And we pray in Christ's name. trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus name I sing that again my hope is built my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil, my anchor holds within the veil, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong. In the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, in the Savior's love. in his righteousness alone faultless stand before the throne let's sing Christ alone one more time Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love through he is Lord, Lord of all. Well, I sure do appreciate the word from John and the Psalms, obviously, uh, this morning. And I thought, you know, um, Sonny and I oftentimes will ask each other, um, you know, tell me three things about your day and how you felt about it. 
And I think that's a helpful process of how we feel about things. And I wonder sometimes about how often we pray how we feel. Um, and I think we as people ask each other how we feel about things. And I think, you know, created in the image of God, that's probably part of God's character too. He wants us to communicate with him about how we feel. But that's not where it stops. We just don't, we don't, God, I, I hate this. Amen. Right? Like, maybe that's how it starts, but it's a process. I think we have to process through. It's not just the on and off switch, I think, with our faith and walking through difficult situations. Uh, as we grow in our faith, God is greatly glorified when, despite how we feel, we are overwhelmed with trust in His character and faithfulness. And I think He gets great glory from that when we have peace that only comes truly from God when we trust Him. Just wanted to um, remind us about a couple of things. As you exit, which we are requesting that that be a prompt thing. I know that's out of character in this, in this particular room. Uh, but uh, as you exit, if you would like to uh, give an offering, they are, you can do that in the wooden boxes by each door. Um, and also, uh, if you're giving online, you can give, uh, or if you're viewing online, rather, uh, you uh, be reminded you can do that as well. Uh, give online on the Give tab there. And uh, um, yeah, I think that's it. I'm going to close this in prayer, and uh, we'll be dismissed. Father God, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your faithfulness through all of it. Uh, the world uh, is not... Uh, a settling uh, place. It's all very unstable. Uh, but you are stable. Uh, you are faithful. And you are the same. And you are good. And Lord, as people who are children of God and part of your kingdom, we want to be ever faithful to the King of Kings. And I pray that we would. And I pray for great trust and great faith as we look to the author and perfecter of our faith. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus and his incredible sacrifice and love for us and leading us an example of faithfulness and sacrificial love. I do pray for protection, for good health for us, uh, and wisdom as we move forward. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed quickly. Thank you.